we are um, impressed, we are excited about your love, about your care over us. We humble ourselves and we invite your presence in our meeting. May you lead, may you guide, may the Holy Spirit inspire us to be excited about your work so that we may finish the work and be ready for the soon coming of our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in the name that we love the most, the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Greetings once again, fellow <laughs> saints, in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm excited. You know, when you plan something, you are not sure um, that it will indeed uh, uh, take off. But when I see the GC personnel on board, our leaders, now I know because uh, this, 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 they are playing the major role in the whole thing. Our church is powerful. Our church is well uh, 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 constructed. Let me hand over to my leader, uh, Pastor Mune, at our SID to take over from me now. Over to you. Pastor Mone. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Nguenya, and good evening to everyone who is in attendance. It's good to see so many people who have joined. I know some of the registered users have more than one person there, so we're currently on 80 participants, um, quite a few in addition to those, and we pray, as uh, Pastor Nguenya said, that it would be a blessing to you and to your ministry and that through uh, this training, you will be more effective in sharing the gospel. Special word of welcome and thanks to the SSPM director and associate director from the General Conference. The director is Pastor Jim Howard, associate director, Pastor Daniel Ebenezer. And we welcome them in a very special way. And thank you for taking your time to share with the South African Union. We really do appreciate that. And we pray that uh, your ministry would be a blessing as you share with the participants this evening. So uh, without further ado, we'd like to hand over this evening to Pastor Jim Howard as we welcome him. And uh, we cannot give him a hand of applause <laughs> as we normally do, but uh, welcome Pastor Jim, I believe Pastor Daniel Ebenezer will be sharing tomorrow evening, um, as well as myself. But uh, thank you for the time that you have uh, made, and may God bless you as you present to us this evening. Uh, I think, I believe you have been made co-host now, which means that you can share immediately from here on. And over to you, Pastor Howard. Thank you, Pastor Mornay. Appreciate so much the invitation to join our friends in the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division and especially the South African Union. Um, we are glad for the technology that enables us to be able to talk directly to Sabbath school teachers and superintendents and uh, other Sabbath school leaders in your territory. And over the next few evenings, uh, we hope that what we share will at least give you something that will help to strengthen your Sabbath schools and be a, a benefit to you, a blessing to you. I, too, want to uh, introduce my associate director, Pastor Daniel Ebenezer, who will share tomorrow evening. Uh, so Pastor Daniel will come to you tomorrow evening. And then uh, I'm not sure, Pastor Mornay, if you are tomorrow evening but or, or the next, but um, I know that all three of us will have something to share. Um, tonight, <clears throat> which is actually 12.30 p.m. here, um, here in my office at the General Conference, and uh, just taking a pause to share with you for the next uh, hour or so. And if there is uh, opportunity, which I believe there is, for uh, questions, we will take that time after the presentation. So as I'm presenting, if there's something that comes to mind, a question of something that I've shared, be sure and uh, and write that down and and uh, and we'll make sure to have a little Q and A time, a question and answer time. 
before we finish today. Um, right now, this evening, I'm going to sort of lay a foundation for us. Um, I'm going to talk about Sabbath school, a little bit of the purpose and philosophy of Sabbath school as we understand it, and uh, and maybe talk a little bit about the revival of Sabbath school and how to promote a Sabbath school revival. And then tomorrow evening, I know Pastor Daniel is going to be zeroing in on the teachers, the Sabbath school teachers. I'll speak about the Sabbath school teachers and give some tips for Sabbath school teaching tonight. But uh, but Pastor Daniel also will go into some more depth. And if you are familiar with what Ellen White has written on this topic, you will know that there is a book, a compilation that has been put together by the White Estate called Councils on Sabbath School Work. And nearly everything that Ellen White has written about Sabbath school, you can find in Councils on Sabbath School Work. And so Pastor Daniel has pulled together um, a number of aspects of what it means to be a good Sabbath school teacher directly from the inspired writings of, of councils on Sabbath school work. And so you'll want to um, you'll want to join us again tomorrow night to see that overview of the inspired counsel and, and encouragement that is given to Sabbath school teachers. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Sabbath school um, in the in the bigger picture and the overall mission philosophy of Sabbath school tonight. So I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. Okay, and hopefully uh, you are able to see it. I think that you are, and unless somebody yells at me, I'll assume that you are. Um, wonderful. Amen. Okay, and with that, I'm going to ask once more if you wouldn't mind just pausing with me, and I'm going to uh, I'm just going to offer one more prayer for us before I dive into this presentation. Father in heaven. So grateful for the privilege of joining together with my brothers and sisters from South Africa here this evening. I pray that the Spirit of God would be given to us and that you would just illuminate our minds, Lord, to understand how we can revive Sabbath school, how we can strengthen Sabbath school, and how we can utilize Sabbath school in the purpose for which it was given. So bless us as we explore this topic tonight. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to abide with us, remain with us, Lord. And we thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, here at the General Conference, Sabbath School and Personal Ministry Department, uh, we highlight the pillars of Sabbath School. And uh, I'm going to see if I can mute someone. There, I did it. Um the pillars of Sabbath school, which if you look into the church manual, you will see that there are four pillars to Sabbath school. There is Bible study. There is uh, fellowship. There is community outreach. And there's global mission. Um, we have sort of packaged these four pillars into three main components uh, that we refer to under the umbrella of the strategy called Sabbath School Alive, because that's what we want. We want vibrant, living Sabbath schools and not, uh, and not dying Sabbath schools, which we have in some territories. So we're, we're aiming for a revival of Sabbath school, and we believe that this will best be accomplished through this strategy we refer to as Sabbath School Alive. It has Bible study and prayer, fellowship, and the two components of mission, local mission and global mission, are combined under one heading that we refer to as mission. And I think you will find that Sabbath school is actually designed, the very design of Sabbath school is using the biblical model of making disciples. So let's take a moment and read from the text in Acts chapter 2 and how they we're making disciples in the early church. The Bible says in Acts 2, 41 and 42, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls 
were added to them. So from the start, we see that the focus of the early church was on spreading the gospel and baptizing people. There was a, the, the focus was on the mission of growing the kingdom of God. You see 3,000 souls added to them right from the start of the launch of the early church. This is the focus on mission in Sabbath School Alive. In that same passage, you'll notice that it says they continued after being baptized in the apostles' doctrine, and then at the end of the verse, and in prayers. Doctrine could be related to Bible study and prayer. So here we also see these strong elements in the early church model of disciple making. After the focus on mission, you see this focus on Bible study and prayer also being mentioned. But then we skipped over a word in this passage, and that was the apostles' fellowship. So not only was there an active focus on mission, not only was there a foundation of studying doctrine, Bible study, and prayer, but also there was a format of fellowship. And these components are what are basically the, the pillars of Sabbath School Alive, of the Sabbath School. And they're based off of the biblical model of making disciples that you'll see in the early church. So the life and growth of the early church was based on the same components as we believe a vibrant Sabbath school is based off of. Mission is where we'll start. So I'm going to go into each of these three components now, beginning with mission. Perhaps some of you have heard that Sabbath school is the heart of the church. Uh, you may not have heard that. Um, this is something that was communicated in years past, but maybe hasn't been communicated as actively uh, in recent years. But I'd like to go back to the year 1948 to a former General Conference president and show you what he had to say about Sabbath school being the heart of the church. Robert H. Pearson was a former General Conference president, and this was his quotation which he shared uh, in an article. He said, a healthy body in order to remain robust must have a good, strong heart. So with the body of Christ, the church, it too must have a healthy, vigorous heart. Then he says, which we all know to be the Sabbath school. It seemed to be taken for granted back then that Sabbath school was the heart of the church. I don't think today we could say, which we all know to be the Sabbath school. I don't think that. Because we have not all maintained this philosophy that Sabbath school is the heart of the church. But it certainly was the philosophy back in 1948. He says, from children, we as Seventh-day Adventists have been told that the Sabbath school is the heart of the church. And so it is. So very strong on the idea of Sabbath school being the heart of the church. He says, just as the physical body cannot live without the heart, just so a church without a smoothly functioning Sabbath school, will inevitably, sooner or later, and probably sooner, become a dead church. So, not only is Sabbath school spoken of as the heart of the church, but taking that, uh, that analogy a little further, he says, without a strong Sabbath school, the church dies. And this is a real cautionary statement for us. We do not want a dead church. So now he's going to describe for us, begin to describe, I'm not going to read everything that he says in this article, but I want to read how he starts to describe what Sabbath school means to the church, why Sabbath school is the heart of the church. He says, first, it will, the Sabbath school will develop the church and cause it to grow. And then he quotes from Ellen White, testimonies on Sabbath school work. The influence growing out of Sabbath school work should improve and enlarge the church. And then he says it does this by becoming a soul-winning agency of the first magnitude. Says the servant of the Lord, the Sabbath school should be one of the greatest instrumentalities and the most effectual in bringing souls to Christ. So right from the start, he says the reason that Sabbath school is the heart of the church is because it causes the church to grow. The Sabbath school work enlarges the church. It's one of the greatest tools that we have 
to bring souls to Christ. This is how the General Conference president was describing the Sabbath school back in 1948. You see, historically, Sabbath school was the primary source of church planting activity, which we refer to as branch Sabbath schools. In addition to this, Sabbath school was also the source or the hub of personal outreach activities conducted by church members. In 1990, Sabbath school action units were introduced, and these included all aspects of personal ministries. They essentially took the Sabbath school and made it a small group outreach uh, unit where there were uh, there were goals set forth for how to uh, reach the neighborhood, reach the community. There were different assignments given to lay people. There were personal ministry activities that were tracked to determine how well they were doing. This all happened in the Sabbath school. Now, this is the point that I want to make here in this first part of Sabbath School Live, mission. Sabbath school began to die when personal ministries was pulled out of Sabbath school. This is what you see. There was a period where we were keeping track of Sabbath school activity or our personal ministry activities in Sabbath school. And there was a strong sense in which the Sabbath school kind of was organized to engage in personal outreach activity. When we stopped keeping track of those things, and some of that was for good reason, maybe there was better ways for us to do it. But we basically pulled everything about personal ministries out of Sabbath school, personal outreach out of Sabbath school, and just made it a study time. When that happened and, and mission was pulled out of Sabbath school, Sabbath schools began to decline. Let me remind you of what happens in some territories, and this may be strong in South Africa. I, I don't know. It's certainly not quite on the level that it is in inter-America and South America, where they emphasize small group ministries. Grupos Pequeños in, uh, in IAD, Inter-American Division. In these territories where small group ministry is emphasized, what happens is they make sure that the small groups are evangelistic, that they always have at least a few members of the small group who are not Seventh-day Adventist, and they're reaching out to these individuals, and they have certain members who are Adventists who are part of the small group who have responsibilities like keeping record or are hosting the meetings or doing something related to the meetings. The point is that they know in these territories that if all of the non-Adventists are gone and it's only a group of Seventh-day Adventists and that's what the small group becomes, the small group begins to lose its energy and soon begins to die. The reason I'm bringing this up is that to some extent, this has happened to us in Sabbath school. Because we don't have an evangelistic purpose in many places for Sabbath school anymore, it has lost some of its energy. There's a certain energy you get when there's non-Adventists in the group, and when there's a, an effort made to, to bring out truths that others are hearing for the first time. Uh, now, Sabbath school doesn't fully die because it's part of the structure of the church. It's, it's, it's already there. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, Sabbath school and church, you know, it's there. You're not really going to get rid of it. Like a small group during the midweek, it may, it may go away. The Sabbath school is not going to go away, but that doesn't mean it will have energy. That doesn't mean it will be strong. That doesn't mean it will have that uh, element that will, that will cause people to really want to be there. So the idea of Sabbath school being the heart of the church starts out, it doesn't only include this, but it starts out with a focus on mission. Now, in the South American division, they have Escola Sabatina Viva, which is Sabbath School Alive in Portuguese, and they are combining this with the disciple-making evangelistic plans of the global church called Global Total Member Involvement. And what they're doing is they've asked every Sabbath school class to fill out a disciple-making strategy, the same disciple-making strategy that, that we for Global Total Member Involvement are asking every church in the global church to do, 
they are asking every Sabbath school to do it because they're trying to reestablish the idea of the Sabbath school as the hub of evangelistic activity in the South American division. Now, we have some uh, support for this in inspiration. Ellen White says the formation of small companies as a basis of Christian effort has been presented to me by one who cannot err. She says, in our churches, let companies be formed for service. Let different ones unite in labor as fishers of men. So this idea of not just doing church-wide type of activity, but small groups and organizing them for service is a perfect model for Sabbath school. And in South America, this is an example. I took this picture when I went to South America for a Sabbath school training event with all their union presidents and all their division officers were there for a Sabbath school training event. And they have established, this is one union. This is says Estudos Biblicos, that's Bible studies. And this is their Sabbath school class chart. And these individuals, Lucia or Lucia, Jao, Jairo, these are members, church members, and they are in the Sabbath school class. And the people next to them, these other names, are the names of people they're giving Bible studies to. So they are actually trying to, and they have a goal down here uh, at the bottom here where they're tracking their goal for a Sabbath school class or how many Bible studies they want to be giving as a Sabbath school class. Up in the top right, they've put a location where they would like to uh, create a branch Sabbath school and actually start a small church in a territory through the ministry of their Sabbath school. So this is, uh, what would I say? This is taking us back quite some time to, in many areas of the world, the the, the Sabbath school model that used to be, to be uh, followed. Now, I'm not going to say that this is something that can easily be done in territories where we've come up, the culture has changed significantly. But we can make movements back toward having the mission element be a component of Sabbath school. And when that happens, you re-engage Sabbath school as the heart of the church. I want to show you a statement from uh, Sabbath school worker. This is Ellen White writing in the book Sabbath school worker, which they, there used to be a publication for Sabbath school teachers and leaders uh, called Sabbath school worker. And that, that's where she's writing in here. Entire consecration of soul must be maintained as much by the teachers and superintendents of our Sabbath schools as by the ministers in our pulpits, for all alike are engaged in the work of bringing souls to Christ. What a powerful statement. So this is what they were doing in South America. They were training their teachers to essentially be like pastors of their Sabbath school class. They were training them to be soul winners. And this is something we need to recapture in our Sabbath schools, even if we don't go to the point that South America is going, but we need to capture, recapture the idea that the Sabbath school teacher is a soul winner. And Pastor Daniel will talk a little bit more about that tomorrow evening. But Sabbath school superintendents and teachers, just like pastors, are to be soul winners. Sabbath school itself should be evangelistic. It should grow the church. Part of the evangelistic strategy of the church should be the Sabbath school. How are we going to use Sabbath school to grow the church? This is something that we've lost sight of in many places, and we need to recapture the evangelistic purpose of Sabbath school. So there's a little bit about mission. Now let me talk a little bit about Bible study and prayer. The Bible says, the words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. This is Jesus speaking about his words. The word of God is living and powerful. Peter says we are born again through the word of God. Do you see that it's the, it's the word that gives life to the church? It's the word that gives life to the individual. And it's the word that gives life to Sabbath school. The Sabbath school textbook must be the Bible. The Bible. Now, I'm going to share with you some statements that Ellen White has to, to share about this for both the individual members of the Sabbath school class and for teachers. She says, study every point of truth, 
that you may know for yourselves what is truth in distinction from error. Notice the, the phrase here, know, for, know how, know for yourselves. Let students search how for themselves that they may know the deep things of God. Here's a danger we have with Sabbath school. Uh, looking for mine. I can't find my lesson. I think it's in my bag. The Sabbath school quarterly uh, is beautiful and it's very helpful. But the textbook of Sabbath school should not be the quarterly. It should not be the adult Bible study guide. And the students need to not just learn from the, the Bible study guide, but they need to know for themselves. So they need to dig into the text that is uh, the main text for, uh, for that week. It is essential, Ellen White says, that both pupils and teachers know that they know what is truth. Okay, this has to do with finding personal conviction in the truth from the study of Sabbath school. The Bible says, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. And this is an important point. Sometimes our members, they, they, they study the Sabbath school as if they are, it's our things they already know. Ellen White says, no one can afford to stand back in an attitude of indifference and self-confidence and say, I know what is truth. I'm satisfied with my position. We need to re-instill in our Sabbath schools the spirit of inquiry, the spirit of growth, the spirit of, of new discovery in the Bible, okay? We shouldn't be just rehashing everything that we already know. It is the Sabbath school teacher's responsibility, hear me now, to bring fresh insights from God's word. This doesn't mean straying from our established truth. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about getting off on some agenda and some tangential you know, information that's speculative. But I am talking about digging into the text and providing fresh insights from the Bible that are in harmony with what we know to be true. Ellen White says, we have the truth brought out in publications, but it is not enough to rely on other men's thoughts. We need to teach people in our Sabbath schools to study the Bible, not just to study the commentary of the author and Clifford Goldstein, the editor. The opinions of your associates may be of value to you, but you should not rely upon them and have no definite ideas of your own. This is for Sabbath school teachers. Don't just take what's in the quarterly and regurgitate it to your class. No, develop a study of the Bible that will give you fresh insights. Teachers need freshness of ideas. Ellen White says, if you take upon you the sacred responsibility of teaching others, you take upon you the duty of going to the bottom of every subject you seek to teach. Do you see the emphasis here? It's on mining the truth to have insights and, and, uh, and thoughts to share that are relevant and that are uh, not just reiterating the same information that we've re reiterated every single time that we share a particular topic. Now, these next couple of quotes touch on a, a problem that we have in many of our Sabbath school classes. Teachers in the Sabbath school have a missionary field given to them to teach the scriptures. Notice she calls the Sabbath school class a missionary field. Not parrot-like to repeat over that which they have taken no pains to understand. In other words, they just read it and they just regurgitated it. They just repeated. They just copied what was what was in the in the quarterly. Notice, in some schools, she says, I am sorry to say, the custom prevails of reading the lesson from the lesson sheet. This should not be. <clears throat> Sabbath school should not be just going through Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and just reading all the statements that the, that the quarterly author provided to us. These are good insights. We should study the quarterly. We should gather insights from there. But we should be studying primarily the biblical text in Sabbath school, because that's where we get life. And we should have fresh insights from that text to add to what has been provided by the quarterly author. So reiterating, this is the bottom line. If we want Sabbath school and our Sabbath school class time especially 
to be alive. The Sabbath school textbook must be the Bible. We're drawing from the Bible. We're teaching people how to find the truth for themselves in the Bible. That is what Sabbath school is intended to do. Now, let me talk about this third area of fellowship. Sabbath school provides an opportunity to engage. It provides a personal touch that is not found in the preaching service. This is the beauty of Sabbath school. Remember, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. This quotation is one that we quote many times when we're talking about disciple making or soul winning. But right after the quote that we normally finish with, where Jesus bade them follow me, Ellen White says there is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. She says, if less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. Christ's method, understand this is foundational to Sabbath school. Christ's method is personal labor. And I have a few references you can go and look up for yourself. Ministry of Healing 143, I just quoted to you, but Gospel Workers 194 says Jesus came close to those he desired to reach. Christ's Object Lessons 229 says that personal labor was Christ's method. And in Review and Herald, she says, if you take big extensive meetings and individual labor, she says, combine them and you have the best possible option. But if only one can be done, she says, let it be the individual labor. Individual personal labor was Christ's method, and it is the priority <clears throat> of the church. Sabbath school is based on Christ's method of personal ministry. Notice Ellen White says there should be much personal work done in the Sabbath school. And a careful review of Ellen White's writings, you'll find that the method that Jesus gave to the disciples was personal, interactive teaching. Let me show this to you. She says there should be less preaching and more teaching. As we approach the end, she says, I have seen that in these meetings there will be less preaching and more Bible study. There will be little groups, not big, huge groups, but little groups all over the grounds with their Bibles in their hands and different ones leading out in a free conversational study of the scriptures. Then she says, this was the method that Christ taught his disciples. Incredible. Let me show you another one. Whenever practicable, every important discourse or sermon should be followed by a Bible study in these little groups. Here, the points that have been presented can be applied. Questions can be asked. Notice that in this setting, uh, questions can be asked. There can be a conversation, a conversational study of the scriptures and right ideas inculcated. More time should be devoted to patiently educating the people. You know, it doesn't require patience to preach a sermon. You just keep preaching. Patiently educating the people is talking about back and forth, questions and responses and, and clarification. And this is the type of teaching that is at the heart of Christ's method. Giving them opportunity to express themselves. It is instruction that men need, line upon line, precept upon precept precept. And then describing all this, again, she says, this was the method of Christ's teaching. Notice in Councils of Sabbath School work, it is not the best plan for teachers to do all the talking, but they should draw out the class to tell what they know. <clears throat> then let the teacher, with a few brief pointed remarks or illustrations, impress the lesson upon their minds. This is a beautiful description of how to run a Sabbath School class. You don't do all the talking. You draw out of the class uh, insights and conversation, but then you come back and with a few brief remarks or illustrations, impress the biblical takeaway upon the minds of the class. Now, notice all of these things that I've just quoted from you from the writings of Ellen White, all in quotations. We should have less preaching, more teaching and Bible study in little groups, a conversational study of the Bible, where the points presented can be applied, questions can be asked, and everyone can be given an opportunity to express themselves. This is the description of a vibrant Sabbath school class. This is Christ's method in action in a good Sabbath school class, where there's actual teaching going on, where there's actual conversation, where there's actual digging into the Word and understanding the Word. Now, the problem we have 
is that in many places, Sabbath School Alive is not the strategy. Instead, the strategy is what we might refer to as Sabbath School Dying, where instead of Bible study and prayer, they have prayerless sermonizing, just a monologue. Uh, repeating the same ideas over and over, no freshness from the word. Then there's never any talk about mission. There's never any talk about personal outreach. It's totally an inward focus. The only people in our class are church members, and we just talk in Adventist lingo, and all we have <clears throat> is an inward focus. And because we have a monologue coming from the teacher, and because we have an inward focus in the class, there's no interaction, no fellowship, no bonding, and this is the, the recipe for a dying Sabbath school class. And dare I say, this is happening in many places around the world. To one degree or another, it's happening. So what we need to do is evaluate our Sabbath school. Is our Sabbath school on the trajectory of a living Sabbath school or a dying Sabbath school? So here are some questions you can ask. Is Sabbath school part of the church's growth strategy? Remember, it should enlarge the church. Does the class plan and engage in soul winning? Is there a mission focus? Is the teacher himself or herself a soul winner? Do they have a burden for the, for the people who come to their class, the members of the class and the visitors in their class? Is the Bible the focus of the class study? Or is it the quarterly or something entirely different? Does the teacher share fresh insights from the Bible? <clears throat> Very important. Is the, is the teacher prepared? Is the teaching interactive? Do they allow for discussion? Do they allow for questions? And do members invite non-members to Sabbath school class? Is it a place where growth can happen? We need to revive the model of the early church. Remember, they were baptizing thousands they were focused on mission. They uh, continued in doctrine and prayers. That's Bible study and prayer. They had the apostles fellowship was central to what was happening with the early church after the, after the, the incredible growth okay. on the day of Pentecost. These three components are essential. They were essential in the early church and they're essential in Sabbath school. We need to get back to them. The mission component gives a sense of purpose to the Sabbath school. The uh, Bible study and prayer component connects us with divine power and the life-giving power of the word. And the fellowship component gives the personal touch, Christ's method of personal ministry. We need to be sure that we are emphasizing each of these three essential components of Sabbath school, recapturing the spirit of the early church. Now, I'd like to, and I'll do this fairly quickly because I want to give opportunity for there to be some discussion and questions, but I'd like to go through uh, these three different groups of people who are key people for Sabbath school revival. Number one, the pastors. Number two, the Sabbath school superintendents. And number three, the Sabbath school teachers. And I'm going to give a just a quick outline of ideas for each of these groups of how they can contribute to a Sabbath school revival. Tomorrow, because the Sabbath school teacher is such a, um, an important, really the most important component to Sabbath school revival is the Sabbath school teacher. Uh, because of that, uh, we're going to take tomorrow evening and Pastor Daniel is going to just break down uh, what the inspired writings have to say about Sabbath school teachers and how they should fashion their Sabbath schools and how they should teach their Sabbath schools and what type of person they need to be to be a soul winning Sabbath school teacher. But I'm going to give a brief outline for each of these three areas now, starting with pastors. So what can pastors contribute to Sabbath school revival? Number one, pastors need to attend Sabbath school. <laughs> I was uh, in church this past Sabbath, and I was I was at a visiting church. Pastor Daniel and I both were there, and uh, I was in Sabbath school, and we were engaged in the Sabbath school class. And right toward the end of the Sabbath school, I was uh, 
going to be preaching that morning. And right toward the end of Sabbath school, the associate pastor found me. And he seemed a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit um, exasperated that he had not been able to find me. He said, oh, great. They, they're looking for you. Uh, they were looking for you to because we need to get ready for the service. And what I wanted to say in that moment was, uh, did you not know I must be about my father's business? <laughs> that was the thing that came to my mind. Not that I'm relating myself to Jesus in any way, but the way that they were acting was very similar to the way that Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, acted when they couldn't find Jesus. And then they found him in the temple, and he said, did you not know I'd be about my father's business? Well, they should know that I was going to be in Sabbath school. It was Sabbath school time. But it's not necessarily expected anymore that pastors be in Sabbath school. The pastor may not even be at church. The pastor may be, uh, you know, in their study, preparing for the sermon, or visiting with someone in the hallway or outside. The point is, we need to be an example of Sabbath school attendance if we're going to expect more members to attend Sabbath school. So this is for pastors. Pastors need to attend Sabbath school. That's the very first step to reviving Sabbath school. Number two, they can promote Sabbath school in ways that others cannot. This Elders can do this as well, but both publicly from the pulpit during church time and privately in their visitation, encouraging people to come to Sabbath school, uh, bringing a quarterly, encouraging them to come to Sabbath school. There's not as much value placed upon Sabbath school as there needs to be. And so pastors can promote Sabbath school. They can emphasize that Sabbath school attendance is not just for their own blessing, but that by attending Sabbath school and having a, a, a good crowd of people at Sabbath school, it encourages everyone. So Sabbath school attendance is actually a ministry to others. It's a vital spiritual habit. It's not just something they do for themselves. One of the things pastors can also do is ensure that the best Sabbath school personnel are chosen. Oftentimes, pastors have some influence in nominating committee and in uh, Sabbath school council. And so the pastor can encourage the best teachers, the best communicators, the best soul winners to be employed in the Sabbath school department as Sabbath school teachers or superintendents. They can also, pastors can, give strong support to children in youth Sabbath school. One of the best ways to grow adult Sabbath school is, to, is for pastors to visit the youth and children's Sabbath school and to show they have an interest in the children and youth of the church and in appreciating and affirming the teachers in the lower divisions who often have thankless jobs. When the pastor does this, it boosts the morale of everyone and it sends a message to the parents that we care, that the pastor cares about the children. And that causes the, uh, the members of the church, the parents in the church, to have a better overall attitude toward the church, toward the pastor, and oftentimes grows the adult Sabbath school. So one of the best ways to grow Sabbath school in general, both children, youth, and adult, is to give strong support to children and youth Sabbath school. Another thing that's very important for pastors to understand is that they need to make sure training is happening for their two superintendents and teachers. I want to share a quotation from Christian Service, page 59. Ellen White says, Every church should be a training school for Christian workers. Its members should be taught how to give Bible readings, very first thing, how to give Bible studies, how to conduct and teach Sabbath school classes. This is part of the training that should be in every church. And she mentions how to reach the poor and work for the unconverted and care for the sick and work for the unconverted. So training Sabbath school superintendents, teachers is an important role of the pastor or making sure that training takes place. Prioritize making Sabbath school interesting. One of the things that pastors can do is don't do this. Um, if, if somebody wants to do something in the Sabbath school program, we say, oh, well, I really want everyone to see that. It's going to be so good. But there's not many people there at Sabbath school time. So let's wait and let's put it in the church service time when everybody's there. This is a failing uh, type of philosophy because what happens is 
eventually all the good stuff gets moved to church service. We we kind of accommodate the fact that people are not attending Sabbath school and it gives them no reason to attend Sabbath school. We should give the best to Sabbath school, not the leftovers. Consider planning exciting programs in your Sabbath school, baptisms in your Sabbath school, whatever. Uh, mix it up a little bit. Don't just put all of the good stuff, all the exciting reports, all of the exciting things into the church service and ignore the Sabbath school. No, prioritize making Sabbath school interesting and it will help to grow the Sabbath school. So that's a little bit about pastors and what pastors can do. Now, the Sabbath school superintendents. Number one, usually there is a, a period of time, a program before the, the class study begins. And this, the superintendent is usually responsible for this time. I don't know how it is in your territory um, precisely, but I'll speak to this um, as this is kind of a general uh, format for much of the world. So the first thing I would say is the superintendent does not need to get up and give a devotional, give a, 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 a sermonette, a mini sermon, and, and, and give a sermon basically before they're going to get the sermon later. Uh, this is not necessary in Sabbath school. And I'll talk for in a moment about what can be done in place of that. Um, instead, Consider establishing a simple mission program. Remember, mission is the focus of Sabbath school. There's nowhere else in the structure of the church's programming where we focus on the global mission of the church. So have a mission program where you ensure that that is included. Here's an example of what you might do for a mission program. And, you know, your time can vary and, and the program can vary. But just an, as a way of example. Let's say you have 20 minutes before you get into your lesson study. You can have welcome everyone, have an opening song, have a world mission report. Even if you're just showing the five minute mission spotlight that we have through Adventist Mission, these videos that are created to be shown around the world. Um, show that world mission report. If you, if you have a, a, a global mission report from somebody live and in person, then for sure do that. But have a focus on global mission. Then local ministry. What could you focus on in your local departments or ministries? Maybe you have uh, a big Pathfinder program that happened. You know, take some video of it and show it during the Sabbath school time. Uh, have somebody come and give a report on that or on the literature outreach you did or on the Bible study program that you're doing or on the evangelistic meetings that are coming up or whatever it might be, some local ministry uh, highlight. Then take the last five minutes and focus on personal ministries and do a little tips and training for how the members can be involved in witnessing and ministering to others. Now, there may be some Sabbaths where it's just a 15-minute global mission report or a 15-minute training on personal ministries or whatever. You can vary it up. But the idea is that it's a mission program, not just remarks by the superintendent on whatever sermon they want to give that particular Sabbath. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just not bringing the focus on mission and the fresh element to Sabbath school that I think would, would bring some people to the Sabbath school. Now, a third thing that superintendents should do is to meet with their Sabbath school council and just pray and discuss how to improve the Sabbath school and how to grow the Sabbath school. How to create a warm and inviting environment in Sabbath school that people love. And how to increase the attendance of Sabbath school. And I can already tell you what one of the things that will have to be decided in that Sabbath school council, and that's the last item for superintendents, number four. Develop an intentional plan for inviting people to Sabbath school. We're, we can't expect our Sabbath schools to grow and to revive Sabbath school if we're not inviting people to Sabbath school. One of the simplest things that we need to do every quarter is develop a plan for how we're going to invite people to Sabbath school for the next study that's going to be coming. Uh, we know that there's church members who are not coming to Sabbath school. Identify who they are and personally invite them. Give them the Bible study guide that, you're, that uh, is going to be studied in that next quarter. Invite them. Make it a personal invitation where you have different members of the church asking different ones, oh, you should come to our Sabbath school. It's really good. And then what about people in the community? 
What about friends, coworkers? If they're, we're studying the book of John, it's an incredible study right now. You know, that's something that people outside of the church could benefit from. And we can make our Sabbath schools something that we're inviting people to, to make it a more uh, dynamic group that's meeting for Sabbath school with new people uh, catching the vision and, and, and learning the truth. Okay. Now the final area that I'll mention in, in the last five or 10 minutes here is Sabbath school teachers. So I'm going to quickly go through the outline of, uh, of what teachers can do to support Sabbath school revival. And the way that I'm going to do this is kind of walk through a Sabbath school class and how, and tips for teachers. Okay. Number one, they need to prepare well with prayer and study. I already talked about bringing fresh insights from the word. There needs to be good preparation if there's going to be a good class. You can always tell when there hasn't been much preparation because either the teacher will just do a monologue and talk about their favorite soapbox, their favorite uh, agenda, or their favorite topic, not even hardly related to the Sabbath school lesson. Or they'll try to get conversation started from the class and, and, and just keep that going the whole time so that they don't have to say much of anything because they don't have they haven't prepared. Either of these are not going to create a healthy, attractive Sabbath school class. Sabbath school teachers, if they're going to have an attractive Sabbath school class, must prepare well. There's no way around it. So that's the first thing teachers can do. Number two, when people come, welcome them with a smile. Even if you're not in a good mood, welcome them with a smile because you don't want to bring people down in Sabbath school. You want it to be a place where they know every time they come, it's a warm environment and a place that is attractive. Number three, review the quarterly class mission project. I think it's a good idea for every Sabbath school class to choose some simple project that they're going to do that quarter. Perhaps it's distribute a particular uh, glow tracks. Okay, I've got this glow track and we're going to try to get out 500 of these this quarter. And so in the beginning of every class, you remind everyone, you pass it out. And you get maybe a short testimony of somebody who has shared. Maybe you one quarter are going to uh, take the names of all of the church members who are shut in or, or can't come to church. And so you have the class decide that they're going to have different ones who are going to visit those people throughout the quarter. Um, you know, maybe it's a service project that you do together or there's any number of things that can be done. But the beginning of class is a time to remind everyone of the quarterly class mission project and give a brief testimony or report. So we're talking about just a few minutes, maybe five minutes. Then I like the idea in Sabbath school of briefly taking any prayer requests and having prayer for those requests in the class. It helps set the tone and it gives a little bit of a familiarity and a fellowship when we know what people's prayer needs are. Now, you start your study. The first thing to do when you start your study is to share the context. Okay, so when I'm studying on the book of John and we're coming into a particular theme, I'll say, well, we've already spent some time talking about the signs of Jesus' divinity. And, you know, I'll give a little bit of what happened last week. If, if we're going chapter by chapter, I'll talk about what we learned in the last chapter a little bit before I get to where I am. Uh, if it's something that's totally topical, and not on a book of the Bible, then I'll just kind of share the last couple of topics that we've touched on and then where we are now. It's just helpful to give the context because not everyone who comes to Sabbath school is there every week. And so you're getting people up to speed. So share the context. It'll make sure that people understand more of what you're talking about. Then ask class attendees to read the key passage or the text. So when you, one of the first things I usually do in my class, you know, sometimes you can have a little hook in the beginning of class, a little story or something. But if I'm being honest, a lot of my time, I just have them start with the text. Let's read together. And we read several verses. And we go and read one verse at a time and go around the class. If somebody doesn't feel comfortable, they just tap the person next to them. But you're beginning to engage the class in this study. Then, while you're going through teaching the lesson, you're going to be asking questions about the text. So part of the preparation is determining what these questions need to be. Um, just in general, you're not talking about overly vague questions like, 
So did anybody get anything out of this this week? Uh, I don't know if you noticed, Pastor Daniel, but when we were in Sabbath school class this week, um, the one of the first questions he asked was was like that. Does anybody have anything to say about this? Well, you know, that's nice. Uh, it'll open it up and people will say all manner of things, right? But if you're going to give some guidance to the class, then ask questions about the Bible text itself. You know, and let's dig into the text. Let's make sure that we're not just having random discussion. Discussion for discussion's sake is not the, the goal of Sabbath school. We want learning to be happening. We want exploration to be happening. So ask questions about the text, the Bible text itself, and not just random questions. Then give people opportunity to express themselves. Uh, I, I, there are some classes where a question is asked, and then before anybody answers, the, the Sabbath school teacher answers, and nobody else is really saying much of anything. You do need to give a few minutes for people to express themselves. And this includes, if there are people who are not expressing themselves, trying to draw out from others. Is there anybody else who hasn't shared who would like to share? And that is a way to engage people in the class. Now, answer your own questions. Um, what do I mean by that? If you're going to ask a question about the text, don't just let people talk for a while and then move on. No, you don't want people to be unsure about the answer to the text. You want to share the answer to the text or reinforce the answer that's been given if, if somebody from the class already answered it correctly. You want to reinforce it, but always answer your own questions. Don't add to doubt in the members by asking some question that they don't know the answer to and then never fully giving an answer. This is something I see teachers do all the time. You're not just trying to provoke people to discussion, provoke people to speculation, provoke people to doubt. That's not the purpose of questions. You're asking questions to lead them into the truth, to lead them to explore the Bible, and then you want to help provide answers. You may not have an in-depth, you know, uh, thesis or anything, but you want to give uh, a concise answer to the questions that you're posing. And when you answer a question, do so from the text, okay? When, when, when people themselves ask questions in the class, you want as much as possible to answer from the Bible, not just yourself. Um, and let me just tell you a, a, a really helpful question that you can ask when you're giving a Bible study or when you're teaching a Sabbath school class, anytime you're teaching, really. You're, you're asking a question about the verse you're, or, or something like that, and the people provide an answer. When they provide an answer, uh, it oftentimes is not from the Bible itself. It's just off the top of their head. And sometimes when people ask questions, the teacher doesn't answer from the Bible. They answer off the top of their head. Instead of doing that, always ask this question. What does the text say? What does the text say? Even if they've answered the, or the question correctly that you've asked, it's sometimes helpful. If you're studying right from the, the Bible passage and you ask, uh, you know, so what does it say here? Which day is the, is the Sabbath day? And then the, the class says, oh, well, Saturday is a Sabbath day. You say, well, that's correct. But what does the text say? Because the text doesn't say Saturday. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Saturday. The text says the seventh day. And then you get from the Bible the seventh day. And then you go and you discover later in Luke or wherever you want to go um, that the seventh day is Saturday. Okay, But that's not what the text says. You want people to get their answers from the Bible. What does the text say? So everything about teaching Sabbath school should revolve around the text of the Bible. Okay, And then applying that to our lives. A very important point for Sabbath school teachers is to just be kind. Your patience is, you know, the, the Sabbath school teacher sometimes has to face people who have argumentative attitudes, uh, some that try to control the class discussion, all kinds of people that you have to deal with when managing a Sabbath school class. But this is the key. Never should a Sabbath school teacher be rude or condescending. Even if it feels like this other person is being rude and condescending. Because here's what will happen. If the Sabbath school teacher 
acts out that way, the rest of the class will be afraid to remark, afraid to comment, and the rest of the class will lose respect for the teacher. Whereas the opposite is true. If you're being challenged by somebody in the class, but you respond kindly and you're patient and you and you you know guide them in a way that doesn't embarrass them, then it will actually gain respect in the class. And so this is a key to Sabbath school teaching uh, is just the attitude. I, I don't have it in here. I actually took it out because I don't really have time. But there's a statement by Ellen White where she's talking about the teaching of Jesus. If you ever want to like look at how Jesus taught, read the chapter at Capernaum uh, in the book, the, the Desire of Ages. But in that chapter, she describes how Jesus attracted the large crowds he did because of his deportment, because of the, the warm and inviting look and, and every word and tone that he had was inviting and it was, it was, uh, attractive and it was not condemning and it was uh it, it, it made people feel safe if you are sharp with people if you disagree with people publicly and these types of things what will happen is the other people in the class won't say a word they'll zip it up because they know that it's an unsafe place so even if people are answering incorrectly you say well that's interesting and don't need to you know, immediately come in and correct everything they just said. Wait until you establish the truth when you give your biblical takeaways, and then you can make your points that you need to make and make it clear. But you need to be careful not to come across as contradicting a member of the class in too strong a way, because it will embarrass them and it will set the others up to never want to say anything. Very important part of teaching Sabbath school. Finally, determined to be a soul winning teacher like Jesus. Sabbath school is a soul winning agency. It's not just for members to, uh, you know, have discussion with one another. It's a soul winning agency. You're trying to win the souls of some church members who are actually on the, on the outskirts of Zion. But you're also thinking about people who are guests and winning them. And everyone there is a soul that can be advanced in their walk with God. And so we need to be soul winners, personal ministry, uh, a, a kind demeanor, and a focus on the Bible. Um, tomorrow evening, Pastor Daniel will go into depth on the soul winning teacher and how Ellen White describes this uh, and what a teacher needs to be in the book, Councils on Sabbath School Work. So these three are very important pastors superintendents and teachers for uh sabbath school revival if we want sabbath school revival we need total sabbath school involvement i like to close uh, this presentation with a, a powerful passage in the book councils on sabbath school work it is certainly important that we become acquainted with the reasons of our faith but the most important knowledge to be gained is the experimental knowledge of what it means to be born again. The great want in our Sabbath school work is the want of the light of life. That's Jesus. All through our ranks are needed men and women who have learned at the feet of Jesus what is truth from their in-depth study and how to present it to others. That's the soul winning Sabbath school teacher. At, the, at its heart, we want people who are born again through the Word of God. And the heart of Sabbath school is the Word of God, both studying it and sharing it. And so Sabbath school should grow the church. And for every Sabbath school superintendent, every Sabbath school leader, every Sabbath school teacher, we have the assurance that Jesus loves Sabbath school. Because Jesus is the master teacher and the master soul winner and he is the one who can help us to bring life into our Sabbath school classes. All right. I appreciate the opportunity to share that presentation with you. And uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, Pastor Mornay or, or who is going to be leading in the next portion, but I think it would be uh, a good opportunity for us 
to try and engage with um, the group here and any questions that they may have. So I guess if there's nobody speaking up, then what I'll do is... I believe it is Pastor Nguenya, and uh, there are some answers. So over to you, Pastor Nguenya. Okay. Um, let, let, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Mune. And um, Jim, that was powerful presentation, my man. That was powerful. That, that was excellent. Um, you are taking us back to what Sabbath school used to be in the past. Mm. And it's my prayer that we take it where it is now to where it's supposed to be. Mm. Um, thank you so much. Let's, 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 let's open it up now. Here is the GC uh, leader. He has made a powerful presentation. Any question? Um. Pastor, I, I see there are, there are two hands up, and there are also some questions which came into the chat, which Sister Yonita has. Can, 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 can you lead out on that one, my man? Can you lead that? I don't see it on my side, but you are in a better position. Can you take it, can, take it up with us? May I go ahead? Thank yes. you, Ryan. Uh, okay. My name is Rines. I'm a volunteer at Advent Hope Online and also staying in Ermelur. I just have one particular question. In the light of when a Bible study is being sidetracked by what I'm going to refer to as personal agendas, what would is there any guidance on how to bring the study back to the lesson, especially with a person that does not respect time and, you know, time frame of 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 a, of a gap to speak in thank you okay so if i understand correctly you're asking about um when people are trying to, to monopolize the time in sabbath school and uh yeah okay so you know there's and this is an interesting an interesting question because when we train our Sabbath school teachers, there's a couple of different elements to it. Of course, there's there's the element of uh, of the text itself and how to create questions and how to um, you know how to uh, use the the study guide and those types of things. But there's also just the the practice of how to run a group, um, how to interact with a small group. And it's almost, uh, they're almost two, they're not, they're, they overlap, of course, but they're almost two separate competencies. Um, and learning how to operate in a group is some of what I was sharing in my presentation. So, um, there are certain key things, do's and don'ts. Like for instance, let's say you have somebody who's monopolizing. Um, you don't want to say, uh, well, you've already spoken. So uh, let me give it to somebody else. Um, that kind of immediately is almost like a little slap on the wrist to, to them. Um, it's similar to not, what, not saying, uh, actually that's not correct uh, or uh, you know what? I'm not sure I agree with that. When you say statements like that, it actually causes people to shrink back, not just the people that you're saying it to, but other people, because they feel like you're being a little too direct. Um, so you, what you often will do is, well, that's interesting. Let me see if I can share a different perspective. Um, those types of, that type of language. This is part of being in a group setting and how to um, lead a group in a way that is warm and a way that is respected by everyone. And one of the things that happens when you have somebody who dominate or monopolize, there's a couple of things that can happen. One, you can be too harsh. Two, you can be too weak. Some of, sometimes the members are like, when is this 
teacher gonna you know end this uh problem and put an end to this problem and if you just let it go and let the class be run over then it can be a problem too so um you know being as polite as possible you need to say let's see if it is there anyone who hasn't had a chance yet and and frequently ask for some who haven't had a chance yet to speak um if someone continually urges okay and they're ignoring your signal that you're wanting to get other people involved um then you know you may have to say something more direct like well let's let's see if we can get an opportunity for you know, I, I see your hand there, but let's see if we can get an opportunity for someone else. I just wouldn't say that initially because I think that they need to be able to see that they're not responding well. The class needs to be able to see that they're not responding well to your cues before you can really have the permission to be a little more direct. Uh, another example would be um, if they uh, are talking too long. Okay, so let's say they're you give them the opportunity to talk and every time they speak they speak for five minutes like they're they're taking these long speeches um once that happens you say you don't do it immediately but at some point there you say now just uh just to make sure everyone has a chance let's keep our comments as brief as possible no more than than uh you know 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes whatever the the time is that you want to give um when you do that you have war forewarned everyone and it seems fair to everyone so that when so that when somebody then starts speaking for well over that you give them a little bit of grace let them go a little over and then people can see that's happening and they know you're giving grace and then you say you know what we're going to need to wrap this up so that we can give other people a chance to talk and then they're not offended by the fact that you're saying that i'm just trying to say in a group you kind of need to set the ground rules a little bit. You need to say things to everyone a little bit. You need to, um, you know, uh, prepare the group before you can be direct or else it can come across in uh, a way that shuts down conversation from the group. But if you don't set those ground rules or you don't insert ground rules later when you see that a problem has occurred, then that can be equally problematic. So uh, it's a good question and it's an art, it's a science. Nobody's perfect at it, but um, it's something that's needed for sure. Lacey? I see... Okay, go ahead, Pastor Mornay. No, just Lacey is next. Thank you, Pastor Monre. Um, Thank you so much, Pastor Jim. Uh, I've got three questions. Let's hope I won't take long. Uh, the first one is, um, it used to be... Uh, I used to know the objectives of the Sabbath school being four, which is that of the word mission story, maybe mission, which centers on the global mission, which comes with mission story, outreach and fellowship. But I've realized that you have um, given us three now, which is study and prayer mission and also fellowship. Um, I just wanted to ask, connecting to that to, to say, is it um, permissible to have a group probably of eight, 10 people from the Sabbath school going to have a Sabbath school with someone who is sick in the vicinity or maybe visiting a home, an old people's home or an orphanage home? Is it acceptable? Uh, will it not be taken as if church programs are disrupted? Um, the second one is who must teach the baptismal class? We have the classes, normal classes, but there's a baptismal class. Is it a is, is it supposed to be taught with a certain officer or office, uh, probably an elder only, or a person who has got a sound doctrine of the Bible? Number three, is it essential to have teachers meeting before Sabbath school starts? Because it seems as if it's no more happening in our churches. Thank you. Okay, w would you mind if we could start, uh, do those one at a time? The first one, I believe, was about the, the pillars of Sabbath school, and there's a little confusion about the pillars of Sabbath school. Um, 
So I'm going to go with that one, and then you'll need to remind me if I forget what the what the further questions were. Um, yes, as I mentioned in the in the presentation at the beginning, there are four pillars of Sabbath school in the church manual, and that has not changed. Those four pillars are Bible study, fellowship, uh, community outreach, which is local mission, and global mission or world mission. Okay. All that we have done with Sabbath School Alive is uh, taken community outreach and global mission and just uh, consolidate that into mission. It's still both are still part of that mission. But we, when we're communicating it, it's just easier for people to track the three categories than the four. But the four are all still there. That's still there. Um, Bible study and prayer. We've always had Bible study fellowship. We've always had fellowship. Now it's just that mission is how we are uh, consolidating both local mission and global mission into that, okay? So that's no change in that. That's the same as it's always been. Um, in regard to the second question, I, I got a little confused. You were talking about going into, uh, taking a small group into uh, some home or some uh, setting where you could have, it sounded like you were talking about a branch Sabbath school, maybe. Um, Something like that. Yes, we still are very strong supporters of branch Sabbath schools. They just aren't happening much around the world. Most of our developed territories have not done that in a long time. Um, but there are some areas that still do. And I've mentioned South American Division specifically uh, in my presentation because they are actively doing branch Sabbath schools. <clears throat> and there are some other territories that continue to do branch Sabbath schools. Branch Sabbath schools, the concept was it didn't even have to be during Sabbath school time. It didn't even have to be on Sabbath necessarily. It was just the Sabbath school was sponsoring, a Sabbath school class was sponsoring a group to go and hold these, uh, these uh, studies. And they may not even use the, the Sabbath school quarterly as the, uh, as the curriculum for the class. It could be Bible study guides or what have you. But it's sponsored by the class, and they are going, and they're starting in a, in a, in a territory maybe where a, a church member lives, but there's no other presence, or, or maybe there's no Adventist presence at all there. And they're going into this area, and they're trying to stir up some interest amongst the people living in that area. We're still strongly supportive of that. It's basically the branch Sabbath school model. It can be done in different ways, but, but we're strong supporters of that. Um, and then the last question I recall you asking was about baptismal preparation classes. Um, this is kind of a, you know, it's connected to Sabbath school, but it's also a personal ministries uh, type of question. Um, there's always going to be the case where the individual who baptizes, usually the pastor, um, will want to spend a little bit of time with the candidates for baptism. But it's not necessarily the case that the pastor or even an elder is doing the uh, baptismal preparation. Uh, there can be church members and others who do baptismal preparation. We have a, uh, well, this is not an English, my English version. Anyway, we have a book that looks like this, but it's in English, called Fundamentals of Faith, that uh, is just a, a thin saddle stitch booklet that any, any church member, there, Daniel's got one, he's holding it up, you can see him. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a simple booklet that can help uh, prepare an individual for baptism. Personally, let me say that I prefer... Uh, personal baptismal preparation over a class. Now, I don't mind doing a class and then having a personal element that happens after the class. But but if all you have is a class, let's say you have 10, 15, 20, 30 people who are preparing for baptism and you have this class, how much do you really know about those? In, how much those individuals understand what they're learning? How much do you really know about whether or not they are making commitments to what they're learning? They're just nodding. You're teaching. They're going along with it. They, they agree. Just because they agree doesn't mean they're prepared for baptism. 
sometimes you need to have that opportunity to have just a few people and and one person or one on one even where you're walking through you know the different beliefs and with each one you're saying so do you have any questions about that does this make sense to you uh have you been able to put this in practice and you start learning where they're actually at without that personal ministry we're having some problems in the church with shallow baptisms and i don't by that i don't mean shallow water i mean shallow understanding uh and so we we go in places we have two week series of meetings we baptize everybody as soon as the two weeks are over and how much you know and maybe there was a baptismal preparation class given but how much do we know that they understand if we haven't had personal conversations with them if we haven't actually talk to them about these things. So I'm a fan personally of uh, more individual or very small group uh, baptismal preparation because I think it provides, it, it sets the members up for success more and to, and to be a more lasting member of the church uh, when they're able to, to ask their questions, be helped with decisions. Sometimes our people haven't, that we baptize, have not made, made a commitment to keep the Sabbath. They haven't even made a commitment to stop some addictive habit or something like that. They Nobody talked to them about it. We just studied the truth with them. We went through the lesson with them. They nodded and said they agree with it, and that's it. But we never really asked them and coached them to actually apply what they're learning. And so baptismal preparation is a bit of a, to me, a weakness in certain areas of the church. Um, even recently when South... Uh, Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division focused in Zambia. It was one of the conversations we had with the leaders in Zambia and that they felt very strongly about, which was that we need to um, focus on baptismal preparation and discipleship after baptism to make sure that we're, we're being thorough. Anyway, I probably took too long on that, but it's a burden that uh, we have here to try and, and make sure that we understand personal ministry is an important element of baptismal preparation. Okay. Okay. Uh, so David, the last uh, one. Two next, please. Um, thank you, Pastor. I appreciate uh, the effort that you guys are doing, uh, having this training. We've been needing this for a very, very long time. And I just want to say thank you. Um, I've got a suggestion, and then I've got two questions. I'll do my suggestion. My first question, I'll allow you to answer that question, and then do my second question. Is that fine? Sure. So my suggestion is I recently read the uh, um, Councils on Sabbath School book and the uh, Sabbath School handbook. And I would suggest that every person involved with Sabbath School should make those books their personal devotional time until they went through those books. Uh, I've been so inspired, so many ideas, and also it made me see the shortage in our Sabbath school in the church. So my first question is about time. I see in the in the chat, there's a lot of people that's got that concern. There's not enough time allocated for Sabbath school. So I don't know how it works there in overseas. Yeah, uh, quarter past nine, it's song service until half past nine. From half past nine until 10, it's Sabbath school mm -hmm. program. From 10 to 20 to 11, it will be the Sabbath school lesson. And then um, 11 o'clock will be the service until 12. So we find that that time allocated for Sabbath school, especially Sabbath school lesson, is extremely short. It happens many times that you cannot even finish the lesson. Can something be done for that? That's my first question. Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you for the, first of all, for the suggestion. I wholeheartedly agree with the suggestion especially councils on Sabbath school work. Uh, many people don't realize that almost everything Ellen White wrote about Sabbath school is in councils on Sabbath school work. It actually says that in the foreword. And that book is not very big. It's it's a thin book. So our Sabbath school leaders would do very well to read that. It wouldn't take them too much time. Sabbath school handbook, of course, is full of good information. <clears throat> we actually are in the process of outlining a new Sabbath school handbook that will try and capture the critical items, but shorten up a little bit. The Sabbath school handbook is a pretty overwhelming volume, um, which is good in some ways, but uh, we find that there's, we would like to 
to zero in a little bit more on the most important elements that we want to emphasize. So we'll be working on that in this next quinquennium if we're still uh, if we're still here, Pastor Daniel and I. Um, now, in regard to your uh, question about the time, um, I can understand where you're coming from. Let me just say that the 9.30 to 10, if it were me, and this is done differently in different areas of the world, and we don't dictate this at the general conference level by any means. But my personal feeling is that uh, the 9.30 to 10 might be a little longer than is needed. Um, as I showed you in my presentation, a simple mission program uh, can be done in 20 minutes. And that included five minutes of an opening song. And you've already got 9.15 to 9.30 for music. So I think that you could definitely, in 15 to 20 minutes, have a simple mission program, and then that would leave you 50 minutes for your study instead of 40, um, which is a which is a, a good difference. And I think that that uh, I would I would think that would be something that your churches may want to consider. Um, I do think that sometimes in that 30 minute section that the superintendent is responsible for, that a lot of times what we've been doing is having a little sermon before the sermon, and uh, because we kind of we, we, we want our superintendent to highlight something or give some sort of special feature or message at this church I was at this past Sabbath. They had a special feature and it was a 10 minute sermonette on prayer. I don't think that we need to do that. I think that if we focus on mission during that time period and go right into the study, then we get our sermon during the worship service. Um, so anyway, that's my conviction on the time, but it's really a flexible thing that each church and uh, territory, you just want to make sure that the components of Sabbath school are all there and that you're having the time that you need for those components. Thank you, Pastor. That's a very good suggestion. My second question is about teachers. Most of the teachers that gives the Sabbath school lesson are not trained teachers and don't know how to teach, don't know how to approach different types of people seeing that we are volunteers there might be some uh sabbath school teachers that are teachers also for uh, um, during the week at schools that do have that training but for instance preparation for the quarter uh you know you get trained to do that um in the in the universities um we don't know that we don't know how to do it we don't know how to 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 work with every age of the children so my question is, how can the church help the teachers to get training, to get what they are needed to be able to train successfully our students? That's, that's good. Um, okay, I'm going to come back to the training in just a moment. I'm seeing some uh, different things that have popped up on the chat. Um, and I want to come back to the previous thing about time. Um, I'm not saying you can't do a class in 40 minutes. I want to be really clear about that. Um, I can teach a class in 40 minutes. I can teach a class in 30 minutes. Um, one of the things you need to understand or the teachers need to understand is that what you try to do when you're preparing for class is come up with your key biblical takeaways. What are your key biblical takeaways? And then you can expound, you can have it be as broad or as tight as you need to based on the time that you have, but you can still get all those key biblical takeaways in. And I'm talking about maybe three or four biblical takeaways. One of my favorite Sabbath school ministries, and I'm not biased at all, but my brother's involved in it. Um, if you were to look on the Sabbath school app in English, uh, and for those of you who don't know, this uh, this blue, you see that blue uh, Bible with the globe and the lines going through it? That's the official Sabbath School app. And if I click on that and go into the lesson, uh, up toward the top, there's this little picture of a play button and a little video screen. You click on that and it brings up all these different videos, Hope Sabbath School and, and Mark Finley and 
and you can watch different Sabbath school to prepare for Sabbath school. The one on the bottom there is called Talking Points. And it's two pastors, uh, uh, Sabbath School First Ministries directors from the Michigan Conference. One of them is my brother, Mark. Anyway, what they do is they break down the Sabbath School lesson into three talking points every week. And then the teacher can build around those talking points. They can add to those talking points. But they are based on, you know, the key passages from the week, the key texts, also some of the insights from the lesson. But they help to make sure that when you finish your class, whether it's short or long, you have gotten across the key biblical takeaways for that week. And I think that's a really good way to teach the lesson is not necessarily to say, oh, did we get through Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? A lot of times you can consolidate those into certain key takeaways. And if you have those, then you can teach the class in a short amount of time or in a long amount of time, depending on whatever you have. So I just wanted to come back to that. Um, now, uh, the question of training uh, for our teachers. One of the things that we want to do in the new Sabbath School Handbook is provide some simple training. But let me just be clear. You've made a good point. Our Sabbath School teachers are volunteers. They may not be teachers by profession. They may not even have the gift of the spiritual gift of teaching in some cases. Okay. And I think that's totally okay, if I'm being honest. We're not trying to, you know, create teachers who attract large crowds or something like we just want to train them in simple methods that will make sure that they don't um, spoil the Sabbath school class for others and that they make it a warm and inviting place for people to come. And so in order to do that, it needs to remain simple. The outline that I gave you just now is kind of a simple outline of things that can be ways that teachers can can be safeguard against making mistakes, really, that cause their Sabbath school to be a place that, that repels people. We want the Sabbath school to be a place that attracts people. Some are going to be better at teaching than others. Some are always going to attract a little more than others, but they can all be trained, even if they don't have the gift of teaching, in simple practices and tips and methods to help them to, uh, to have a class that, that can be a place where people, you know, have a good experience. So, I do, I do think that we need training, but it needs to remain simple. And we are working on a training module that can, that can help to do that um, because we believe it's essential for Sabbath school teachers. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you I appreciate it. Can go, if, thank you very much. If we can go back to a previous question, the third question from uh, Sister Blessy was, is it still important to meet as teachers before Sabbath school oh. starts and how essential is it? Thank you. Yes, thank you for bringing that back. My apologies, Sister Blessy, for forgetting that question. Um, this is something that varies widely in the world church. We have not um, given any type of mandate. It's not some required part of the Sabbath school structure. It's something that in many territories has been done with great success for a long time. Um, and so... If you look in some areas of the world, they wouldn't dream of doing it. They can barely get people out at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, but in other places, it's been successful. And if they let go of it, I think it could be it could lead to a decline because there's benefit to the teachers uh, reviewing and having a clear idea of where they're headed with their class. So I'm I'm personally, I like the idea of these teachers meetings. Um, I grew up in a territory in the North American division that really didn't have teachers meetings. It's only been through my international exposure with the church that I have discovered the power and value of these teachers meetings in many other areas. So as much as I know that there's probably a tendency to let it go because it's another requirement, if it's part of the structure already, and it's part of the culture already, I would try to continue it because from what I have seen, it has added to the strength of Sabbath school teaching in those territories. Now, I'm sure it depends on who's leading out the teacher's meeting and how effective it is. But in principle, I think that the teacher's meeting is a good practice. Um, anytime that you're doing more preparation, it's a helpful thing is going to help your Sabbath school. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sister Zinchle. But before we get to her, um, I did post councils on stewardship and the Sabbath school manual, electronic versions, uh, based on uh, Brother David Keen's uh, comments. And I see Brother Ebenezer, Pastor Ebenezer, has also posted the different um, uh, platforms on Apple as well as Android. So please look in the chat for those um, uh, for the who are interested in that. Thank you very much. And Pastor Mornay, I just added my PowerPoint presentation that I that I shared with you. You're muted right now. Uh, excellent. I see it there now. So there's five resources there now. Thank you very much. Sister Zinchley. Thank you, Pastor, for this presentation. It really has been an interesting session and truly enlightening. Um, I've always known Sabbath school to be the heart of the church. However, I never understood this given how Sabbath, uh, Sabbath school takes place in, in, in our churches today. The point I want to bring across, um, well, more like seeking advice from yourself or the floor, is that um, since COVID, our ch churches have had fewer and fewer attendees, um, thereby causing church leadership to recommend starting church a bit late, meaning Sabbath school is condensed into, you know, a 10 or 15 minute summary how would we um, go back and uh, engage leadership in such a way that eventually Sabbath school is revived? Um, are there best practices um, or examples that you've seen where um, Sabbath school was um, dying or non-existent in other churches and it was revived? Um, if you could share that with us, thanks. Um, just a follow brief follow-up question. So, after COVID, you're saying that in many churches, they have <clears throat> eliminated the Sabbath school classes and just had someone stand up and give a 10 to 15 minute overview of the Sabbath school lesson and then move on with the service. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, that's sad. <laughs> yeah, um, that's not Sabbath school. That's all I can say about that. That's not Sabbath school. That's not even a, a replacement for Sabbath school. Keep in mind that the three elements have to be there in order for it to be Sabbath school. And one of those is fellowship. We can't just have somebody standing up at the front. There has to be a gathering of the people, a conversation. There has to be that opportunity given or else it's not Sabbath school. Um, it's interesting to me that in these same territories, I'm assuming they're meeting now for the worship service. Is that correct? Yes, they, they do. They do. Okay. So all of this is telling us is that we have lost sight of the value of Sabbath school. So in, in my, you know, for me, if I was a pastor in a district and that's what they wanted, I would have a sermon series on the um, on Christ's method. Christ's method, as I shared with you, was interactive teaching. There needs to be uh, less preaching and more teaching, less preaching and more Bible study. And then I would talk to the congregation and I would say, or to the business meeting, and I would say, which direction we want to go? Council is telling us we need less preaching and more teaching. And we're having less teaching and more preaching. And the council says we need little groups with conversation, and we're blocking out any conversation. So we need to reinstitute re our Sabbath school so that we can be following Christ's method of ministry. That's what I would do. And I, it really comes down to leadership understanding the value of Sabbath school. Uh, and, you know, Usually, leadership understands the value of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, so that's a good place to start, is to just remind and bring to light um, some of the counsel we have on the importance of the Sabbath school as a soul-winning agency and as a time for fellowship in the church. There's really no other thing like it in the church. Um, yes, Individual territories have small groups, and some do and some don't. Uh, midweek services, some do, some don't. Um, but around the church, we have Sabbath school. 
And to the extent that it begins to die, we will lose the denominational feel of the church, and it will take more and more of a congregational feel, where each congregation is in an, on an island of its own and loses touch with the rest of the church. Sabbath school gives us that beautiful connection with the rest of the church. I would bring all those elements into speaking to the church board, speaking to the business meeting, preaching uh, at the church service, and help to to use that as a uh, launching pad for reestablishing the Sabbath school in those churches. Thank you very much, Pastor Isaac Solomon next. Thank you, Pastor Monet. Um, Pastor Jim, thank you so kindly for a, a very informative presentation. Thank you also for the intention to revise the Sabbath School Handbook. My question is related to the handbook. There is somewhere on in the handbook, it states that um, once a month, our action units should be out uh, fulfilling their mission, whatever their project is. Um, your take on that, does that happen? Do you advise that? Yeah, thank you for that question. <clears throat> As I mentioned, um, the Sabbath School Action Unit is a model of Sabbath School that was really introduced to the church in 1990. Um, and I think it's a good model. Um, it's got some um, specific limitations that I don't think that that I think we can be flexible with, for instance, the size of six to eight. Um, I think we can have larger than that and still accomplish uh, what we need to in Sabbath school. I like, you know, 12 to 15 as more of a, a top end number rather than six to eight, although I do understand that six to eight would still be good. Um, and then the monthly outreach and these types of things, th these are excellent best practices. Uh, they are not happening in most places. Um, I will say that um, certain territories that emphasize Sabbath school uh, are doing that and more. And I mentioned uh, South America, where division-wide they're attempting to do this. Also, some other territories, like the Philippines, have what they call Sabbath school care groups. And these care groups um, are really the foundation for all their evangelistic effort. And that's basically what they're doing in South America too. Um, the, the beauty of using Sabbath school for member involvement is that, or, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the beauty of using Sabbath school for evangelistic work is the member involvement. Sabbath school is, you know, it the composition of Sabbath school is church members. And it's not necessarily even church officers. It's church members of all stripes. And I think that that uh, has some real appeal to it. And it's, it's the beauty of, uh, of using the Sabbath school as a launching point for our evangelistic effort. So um, we do still uh, support Sabbath school action groups and action units. Um, some are doing that uh, intentionally. But even if a church is not to that point where they're going to adopt all of the characteristics of a Sabbath school action unit, I think that reintroducing a mission element, and by mission, I don't just mean mission education, like learning about what's happening around the world, but mission activity by the Sabbath school, I think this is a good practice for every Sabbath school, even if, as I mentioned, they start small with you know, um, even a quarterly mission project that they engage in together. Um, and then, like you said, it could be once a month where they go and do that activity, or it could be sprinkled throughout the quarter. It could be different members of the Sabbath school class at different times in the quarter. There's many different ways it can be done. But I think that reintroducing the idea of mission involvement by the members of the Sabbath school class would get us a long way. But certainly, um, if you can if you can install or institute a Sabbath school action unit, you're ahead of most um, and by all means would support that type of format for Sabbath school. 
Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Monet. Uh, Pastor Jim. Uh, thank you so much. I also enjoyed the presentation. I just want to go back a little bit to someone who raised the question around time. There is not enough time. I want to remember that I once read something in your website of the Grow, uh, uh -huh. grow model. I think you you spoke as a department. You was you were recommending one hour of Sabbath school discussion. And of course, it ties together with what you just said today about the 20 minutes, at least at the most of the, the, the program. Then you said one hour and that one hour, you said it can be divided into two. There's some caring time, I think 20 minutes or so. And then the rest of the other time about about 40, is it 40 minutes, it will remain for the discussion of the lesson. So are you still uh, recommending that? Because if that is the case, then um, we churches can start not at quarter past, we can start at 10 past. We can have our song service at nine and 10 past, we can start half past nine until half past 10. Then that time, that whole hour can be used for that time of the class. I just want you to confirm if, if is that still the case. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, as I have tried to communicate, um, there is no um, rigid standard that we are setting for everyone because Sabbath schools are done in different ways, slightly different ways globally. Um, as you have described, what you have described to me as, as in terms of what normally happens in South Africa, um, it seems to me what, that what you said makes sense. Uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, you, you have a song service normally, and, and let me just start with where you're already at, which is 915. You have music at 915 to 930. Um, if that has already happened, then what I shared as a mission program, which had five minutes of that, is unnecessary. You've already done that for 15 minutes. So you could really have the rest of your mission program could be only 15 minutes, where you highlight some your global mission report and then a local mission report, or your global mission report and then a personal ministry training spot, or something like that. Then you would have basically half an hour for your program, 15 minutes for music and prayer, and then 15 minutes for your mission focus. Then at 9.45, you begin your class time, and there may be uh, you know, a welcome to everyone. Um, you may highlight your quarterly mission program um, or quarterly mission activity you're doing as a class. You may see if there's any prayer requests and then have prayer before beginning your lesson study. So let's say you take 10 minutes to do that, now you're coming to 9.55. Uh, maybe you have five minutes of transition time, so maybe it's more like 10 o'clock. Um, and then I would think you could go to 10.50, where you have 50 minutes of actual study, and then you have 10 minutes transition time before you start your service at 11. Hey, modify it as you wish. A little, a few minutes here, a few minutes there. Um, but that seems like a basic structure that I could get behind um, because it keeps the first part fairly tight, focused on mission, gives enough time. I think 50 minutes is a good time for the study time. Um, so I'm not sure what you saw on something we said on the website or whatever, but what you're describing to me or what I've just described to you, I think is a reasonable amount of time for the different elements of the Sabbath school. Thank you very much. Um, Pastor Sio Ketsa is the Sabbath School Personal Ministries Director at the Northern Conference. And the previous speaker, Pastor Isaac Solomon, is, I believe, Sabbath School and Multicultural Director at the KwaZulu Natal Free State Conference. So I went a bit quick, didn't do the formal introductions because of time. Uh, Alistair, next, please.
Thank you so much, Pastor, for an excellent uh, presentation. I, I like the ideas about uh, the, uh, the mission focus and, and, and the action groups. And I just want to say here, our challenges as a church would be to get that um, paradigm shift, that model shift in the minds of our congregations. Because as it is, we have people coming to Sabbath school lesson study and many people do not want to answer questions and, and take part, come to listen mostly. Now, if we're going to do the other and, and have the action groups and, and have the Sabbath school mission focused, um, we it will be a challenge that we have to, as a church, uh, see how can we um, get people to start thinking differently of Sabbath school as a time to uh, go into our communities, reach out to others, have the Sabbath school more mission focused instead of a time where people just come and sit down and listen and have more sermonizing. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It is a paradigm shift, a culture change. I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the study hour be used to go out into the community. Um, oh. When I talk about going out in the community, that would be outside of the study hour. Okay, the study hour, uh, or whatever you want to call it, the class time on Sabbath morning would remain class time. Um, oh. but, when, but what we mean is that the Sabbath school becomes a class that is somewhat of a united group um, that both invites non-members into its fellowship to, to be a uh, evangelistic opportunity and also works together outside of the class on certain mission you know, endeavors, outreach projects, outreach activities, et cetera. Um, you're going to have to, anytime you're changing the culture, there's a couple things you need to do. Number one, you need to cast a vision. Like, I would never try to do this without first establishing for people, look, these were the components of the early church. Um, the, the, the mission grew because the lay people were going everywhere preaching the word. And then thousands were baptized in a day. And the early church was built on growing. And then they continued in fellowship. And they continued in Bible study and prayer, doctrine and prayers. I would show that and say, these elements are essential for the growth of our church, and these are the, the key components to Sabbath school. And if we look at, and then I would show where inspiration breaks that down and says that the Sabbath school should improve and enlarge the church. It should be a soul winning agency. And I would add these things in and say, so what does our Sabbath school look like and how can we make it what God intended it to be? And then the second piece after the vision casting and trying to uh, help people understand the reason would be the actual implementation of change. And implementation of change doesn't happen just like that. I mean, there are going to be certain elements that we may want to start with, making sure that we have a mission focus in our mission education portion, making sure that maybe we have some simple quarterly mission projects that we add that a class can begin to do where people have a certain number of glow tracks they're trying to get out that quarter or something rather simple. Um, I think that in general, when you talk about the classes listening, there are certain things you can do to transition from spectator to uh, interaction. And some of those are having people read, asking people to read, asking people who have not commented if they have any comments to share it's not something that happens easily people need to get um comfortable and i think that it, it does take time but let me just tell you something i'm going to shoot straight with you if the ministries and institutions of the church many of them had their way they would try to do all the work of the church through outside help they would bring in evangelists, Bible workers, media ministries, and they would try to win all the souls through that because nobody wants to work through the local church because they think the local churches are dead. The local churches aren't going to follow it up. The local churches aren't going to do it. You know, at the heart of it is 
The local churches are our members. They are believers who need trained. Ellen White says many would be willing to work if they were taught how to begin. Mm. They need to be instructed and encouraged. We mm. need pastors who are willing to do hard work. It's a lot harder to try to motivate the members, to try to slowly, individually nurture them into you know, a more active experience. It's a lot harder to work through the church members than it is to just try to do everything through outside help. But I believe that if we really want to finish the work, we have to have an inside out reformation. Mm -hmm. We need to start at our churches and do the hard work of slowly but gradually casting the vision for a change of culture in our churches to be active members, active disciple makers. And I know that I've probably said too much about that, but that's my uh, you know, sense is that uh, we just kind of give up on the local church because they don't, their culture is not to speak, not to work, uh, not to be active, but they need instructed and encouraged. They need somebody with some, some moral strength to get in there and, and tell them, you know, let me, let me share another statement with you. Ellen White says, let ministers teach church members that in order to grow in spirituality, now hear me now, she says, let ministers teach church members that in order to grow in spirituality, they must carry the burden the Lord has laid upon them, the burden of leading souls into the truth. Unless our members take hold of that burden of leading souls into the truth, of expressing their faith, of becoming active in disciple ship and active disciple makers, they won't grow in spirituality. So we need to be coaching our members in this, helping them to understand the vital role of their own engagement in the life of the church and in the mission of the church. And that's the only way in my mind, the church is really going to prosper in the end. And Sabbath school and personal ministries are on the front lines of that work. We're at the heart of that work. So there's my Thank speech. You. Oh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. We've got Should our work cut. Thank you. No more questions. Back to you, Pastor Nguyenyo. Wow. Thank, thanks a million. Um, listening to our people, this is a long overdue um, training. And, um, you know, Carrying the Sabbath school plus the, the personal ministries plus other departments together, uh, somewhere you have to 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 compromise and uh, run with the other, less with the other. We we try our very best, you know, to accommodate our people in Sabbath school. But no matter how much, the work is very vast, and again. Um, not much that is, 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 is done. I appreciate the, com the, the, the comments and it shows that our people really needed to hear this. Um, for now, let me thank Jim. Let me thank Pastor Mune um, because, you know, the way, our way to the GC is through <laughs> our SID, but Pastor Mune is always there you know, to, to do what he can so that we can receive the training and the attention that, that, that we need. So Pastor Mune, a lot of people were not able to log in because um, it, it, the, the system could not accommodate uh, more than 100. So we need to make a plan so that tomorrow, I, 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 those, those that managed to log in, please, um, let others know that tomorrow they will be accommodated. Can you say much on that one, uh, Pastor Mune? You have sent me a, diff a, a link to that effect. Yes, I also posted the same link in the chat. So please copy this and use the new link so that uh, those who were not uh, able to log in will be able to log in tomorrow evening. It is in the chat, and um, I think maybe we can just send it out again tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
I think it's the right time then now um, to round everything off. Once again, thanks Elder Jim for the powerful presentation. Thank you, uh, Pastor Mune, for coming in and assist us right through. Let's pray and thank the Almighty God. Don't forget tomorrow to log in. Uh, those that logged in a bit late, they were locked out. So <laughs> let's try to be in so that because the link, the link again, um, there are people outside our SAU that uh, also made this day. Let's, let's pray then. Father in heaven, we thank you in a very special way. What a powerful evening. You used your men servants in a powerful way. I pray, Father, that we will take Sabbath school where it is, to where you want it to be, an instrument to win the souls, an instrument to ground our members further deep into the word of the Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.